Our topic for today's discussion is, has the Federal Circuit lived up to its mission of providing uniformity and stability in patent law? It is a fitting topic for our discussion today because 20 years have passed since the Federal Circuit was created. In 1982, Title 28 of the U.S. Code was amended to create the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. That amendment gave the Federal Circuit exclusive jurisdiction over all appeals from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and from the federal district courts in cases arising under federal patent laws. Now, one of the main reasons for the creation of the Federal Circuit was to ensure that patent law developed in a uniform and predictable manner. Twenty years after its creation, opinions are mixed as to whether the Federal Circuit has lived up to its purpose. Some believe that the Federal Circuit has had an enormously positive effect in the development of patent law. On the other hand, others accuse the court of unpredictability, claiming that results are often panel dependent. What that means is results are dependent upon the individual views of judges assigned to a particular case. Now, I think as far as the positive influence of the Federal Circuit is concerned, there is no doubt that patent law has become more predictable today than it was back in 1982 and is much easier to advise clients on patent matters. Part of this is because the general state of patent law has moved in the direction of upholding patents and adding teeth to the presumption of validity of patents. As one would expect, patents have become valuable property assets. However, despite the successes of the Federal Circuit, many have complained that not only are, panels, uh, are there intra-panel conflicts, the court has moved beyond its original mandate. These people say that since its creation, the Federal Circuit has moved to overrule precedents, even in areas where there was uniformity between the different circuits. So to see whether the Federal Circuit has been beneficial to patent law, we have a panel of very experienced and highly respected patent litigators. These folks were there when the Federal Circuit was born in 1982. They have played a role in the Federal Circuit's evolution. And now with the Federal Circuit being in its 20s, they're ready to step back and evaluate the court's performance so far. Stephen Judlow will serve as our moderator tonight. He's a member of the Board of Directors for Cardozo School of Law and heads the intellectual property practice at Morgan, Lewis, and Bacchus, which is a big national firm. He began his career in 1959 at Bell Labs, first as a member of its technical staff, and later as a patent attorney. In 1966, he decided to enter pr private practice, and since then, for the last 30 years, actually more than 30 years, close to 40 years, he has been trying patent cases. He has a reputation for being a phenomenal litigator, and has been listed among the best lawyers in America for IP law. So I turn the panel over to Mr. Judlow. Thank you, Aaron, Aaron for those uh, kind remarks. I need to find adjectives to these guys now, and I'm not so sure that uh, I, I can even do justice to uh, uh, those other remarks. I think as moderator, it. I thought it was my job to thank everybody who needed to be thanked. Everybody who needed to be thanked has now been thanked twice. So I thank the people for thanking the people who <laughs> needed to be thanked. Um, <clears throat> we have a uh, panel here of uh, uh, people of different experiences. Uh, one um, professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School who's a full-time professor, <clears throat> and I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, we have, as the other four panelists, people who have been active in trying cases for uh, about the same period I have. I think we all have more years in this than uh, we admit to. We have experiences before there was a federal circuit, and we certainly have experiences um, in the 20 years that the federal circuit has been in existence. Everybody um, on this panel uh, who's, uh, who, who's a litigator, that is a practitioner as opposed to a, um, our professor, is uh, credentialed in 
at the highest level of this profession. Every panelist is a member of a who's who of the various domestic and international lists of the best lawyers um, in America, although I suppose best lawyer in New York is a surrogate for the same kind of distinction. And um, everyone has written extensively, has litigated extensively. Um, as between us, I kind of wonder who's taken more money from whom. I, I think this is a zero-sum game, but uh, sometimes <coughs> the uh, amounts have been substantial. Um, John Sweeney still owes me money from diapers, but we'll let that slide for a different day. Uh, there really is a sameness about their backgrounds, and so I will introduce them uh, in the order that they'll be speaking. And they'll obviously be speaking about the federal circuit or some topic uh, <clears throat> which is of current interest in the, uh, uh, the law of patents as the federal circuit is, uh, is developing. Uh, Pat Rosano, a senior partner at Fitzpatrick Cello, uh, and I won't talk about each of these firms uh, specifically because everybody is from one of the uh, leading patent law firms in the country. Uh, 34 years of experience, uh, Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute and uh, George Univer <coughs> Georgetown University for Law School. He'll be our first speaker. Um, John Sweeney, to my right, is a senior partner at Morgan Finnegan. He has uh, done extensive litigation for any number of the major corporations in the country, the likes of uh, Procter & Gamble, which is my personal experience with John and digital equipment. Bachelor of Science at Carnegie Mellon, also a graduate of um, uh, Georgetown University. Pat and John will be speaking about uh, the federal circuit itself uh, and some of the uh, issues, problems, and persona of the uh, federal circuit that Aaron uh, outlined. There is something called claim construction that I'm sure we'll get to later, which has um, become a pervasive topic, something of a controversial uh, topic at that. Our first speaker on that will be uh, Herb Schwartz, which is, Herb is on the far right, senior partner at Fish and Neve. Uh, Herb is an adjunct professor of um, patents, trade secrets, and related issues at the uh, University of Pennsylvania Law School. Um, BA in science, electrical engineering from MIT, uh, masters from University of Pennsylvania. Herb is also a um, fellow of the American uh, College of Trial Lawyers. Somewhere in here, but not on my list, he picked up a law degree. I'll let him tell us uh, where that was from. Uh, our other speaker on the subject of claim construction is Professor Polk Wagner on my far left. He's uh, <coughs> a professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, Bachelor of Science in Physics from the College of Charleston, uh, Bachelor <coughs> of uh, Science, Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering from the University of Michigan. Uh, London School of Economics, JD, and Stanford uh, Law School. Extensive publications on patent uh, on patent issues. And uh, <coughs> the final speaker in the center on my left, uh, Jerry Sobel, again senior partner at uh, K. Scholler, adjunct associate professor of uh, at NYU Law School, um, teaching courses in um, patent law and also. Uh, in the law of uh, antitrust. He has uh, <laughs> recently been successful in the um, uh, Celebrex case uh, representing Pfizer and defeating a patent uh, held by one of the New York universities. Uh, he'll tell us about it. Anyway, the COX-2 inhibitor was a major drug. I'm sure he'll tell us about it. He, he tells me about it all the time. Uh, the Celebrex case uh, which had an interesting, uh, interesting history. Now uh, we have something of a, of a mixed group here, and let me err on the side of making sure everybody gets brought up from the same, on the same page. The, the Federal Circuit, um, Federal Circuit Court of Appeals was created in 1982. Its ostensible, ostensible purpose was to unify patent law prior to the Federal Circuit appeals and patent cases. Uh, which were tried in district courts, went to the regional circuit like any other case 
there were issues said to be had about that. And so we now have, if I haven't said it before, this interesting social science experience by having a specialized court. Uh, the Federal Circuit has some other minor jurisdictions, such as uh, various government employee uh, issues, and, uh, customs, but its principal agenda is to decide all of the patent appeals in the country. And so you have one centralized body uh, responsible for all of the appeals. It is chosen to sit for the most part in Washington, which means uh, there are those who say that it's politicized. I think it's correct that none of the judges of this federal circuit have ever seen the inside of a courtroom in anger as a practicing lawyer, uh, although several have gone back to sit as uh, uh, district court judges to uh, get some experience with the matter. And so they're passing a lot of edicts about what patent law is and should be. There's some history to that, which some of the, um, well, all of us predate, I'm sure, in practice, the, uh, the federal circuit. Patents are, and patent protection are a right important enough to have been included in the Constitution. However, by, <laughs> as we got into the early stages of the 20th century, there had not been uh, very much respect afforded to, uh, to patents. Notwithstanding the constitutional <clears throat> protection, uh, various circuits have went <clears throat> several decades, the Sixth Circuit did, without ever upholding uh, a patent or giving a patent judgment. The real damages in patent law were are in lost profits uh, because of the then um, <clears throat> obtaining law, uh, the requirements for proving lost profits case were onerous, and uh, uh, you can count on the fingers of one hand the number of lost profits uh, cases that uh, were decided. It got to the point sometime in the 30s or the 40s where um, a either it was a Supreme Court opinion, either a concurring opinion or a dissenting opinion, said the only valid patent is one we can't get our hands on. And that was a state of affairs which is very peculiar since... Um, on an economic basis, I think everyone would agree that this country is not going to compete on its um, uh, fungible labor, but was going to have to compete on technology and, uh, and innovation, and the state of the patent law was inimical to that really happening. Along came the federal circuit, along came the, um, uh, the uniformity, perhaps along came the uniformity to a fairly well, uh, and uh, we'll hear some about that. Issues that had never been raised before, like this claim construction has taken a life of its own, uh, causing reversal rates that are <clears throat> angering district judges who don't want to even hear patent cases at this point because of the reversal rate being as high as it is. And so there's consternation. Over it. And the issue of uh, what has the legislation that created the federal circuit wrought um, has been the subject of a fair amount of debate. And... Um, uh, to begin that debate, uh, why don't we have Pat Rosanis tell us something about the Federal Circuit. Yeah, good evening, and thank you for having me here. Um, my topic tonight really is to discuss the inter-circuit conflicts uh, among panel decisions. And before I get into that, I'm, uh, I try to answer, at least from my perspective, the question of the, the night, whether the court uh, has brought uniformity and stability to the patent law. Um, Steve is correct. I was around before the Federal Circuit was in existence. I was a patent examiner and attended many arguments at the CCPA. And um, from that experience, I was opposed to the idea of having a Federal Circuit. I was on the New York City, um, the City Bar Association Patent Committee at the time. And there was a lot of animosity to it. The people thought at the time that um, it was better to have cases percolate up through various courts of appeals, and then the Supreme Court would uh, resolve any conflicts among the circuits. Well, that obviously wasn't happening, and the Supreme Court itself was sort of anti-patent at the time. Uh, the Federal Circuit went in, and 20 years later, in my judgment, I think they were right to institute the Federal Circuit. It isn't perfect. It uh, has brought uniformity and stability in many areas of the law. Um, 
It's helped make the patent system stronger. Patents mean something today that they didn't do before. Um, and there is criticism of some of the decisions. And on my topic, the number of cases where there are intra-circuit conflicts. But <clears throat> you should all remember, uh, even as a, a hint when you go out and practice and appear before a judge or a panel, they are just human beings. They live the same kind of lives you do. They make mistakes. And these things will occur, but they do work hard, in my judgment, in trying to bring stability and uniformity and to correct their errors. And they've been forthright about it. In recent years, um, some of the newer judges, although I guess perhaps is not too new anymore, uh, Judge Guy Arthur, uh, who also was a patent examiner and who did try patent cases, um, has pushed the circuit more to have in bank hearings to resolve some of these conflicts. There has been a resistance by some uh, aspects of the court to do that because they feel that it is an inefficient process. Uh, it takes as much time, apparently, for the court to decide an en banc issue as it does for five or six panels to decide five or six different cases. And so it consumes a lot of the court's time. But they are focused on it more now than they were before. Um, as I said, my topic is uh, intra-circuit conflicts. It's not intended to be critical of the court. Uh, these things happen. And I just want to explain the mechanisms that the uh, courts the court has adopted to try and avoid this uh, from happening. Uh, when the court first got, uh, was instituted, because of their charge to bring uniformity, from my perspective, again, I think there was a tendency by the judges on the bench then, and to some extent still today, to write very sweeping, broad-based decisions to try and cover a multitude of sins and, and to make a, a, a bright line test on a particular issue. An example, for those of you that have act, have taken any uh, patent law courses, a uh, prominent case which other people will discuss, I think, later tonight, is the Vetronics case, which had to do with, uh, in a Markman hearing, whether you could use extrinsic or intrinsic evidence. In that case, uh, the panel essentially said you can't use extrinsic evidence, in, in, in any case, almost. And people have interpreted it that way. Subsequent panel decisions tried to uh, put nuances on it to avoid it. And ultimately, the same judge that wrote the Vitronics decision had to come back and write another opinion in Pitney Bowes, sort of rectifying it and acknowledging that extrinsic evidence could be used. All of those problems arose because he wrote too broadly in the original case and didn't deal directly and only with the facts before him. Um, the the court has established procedural um, a, a procedure for trying to avoid intracircuit conflicts. From the beginning, it has assigned a, a technical advisor, um, or who's an attorney, who reads every panel decision before it's issued, and his responsibility is to compare it with earlier decisions and notify the panel if there's a conflict. Um, once that's done, uh, the decision, if it's a precedential decision, is circulated to all of the other members of the court. And apparently this is unusual on the federal circuit as compared to the other circuit courts. Uh, those members, those non-panel non members, then have seven or eight days within which to comment on the panel's decision. And this gives uh, the opportunity for everyone to search their memories for cases that they worked on or points that they've made in prior cases to make sure that there's no inconsistencies in these opinions. Um, they also have adopted a practice that any single judge on the court can prevent a, an opinion from being released by uh, signing what's called a pink slip. Uh, and that will hold up the publication of the opinion until he, can, he or she can comment on it to the panel. The deciding panel doesn't have to take this uh, and, and do anything with it, but it gives him and that judge an opportunity to make his comment. 
And any judge also can ask for the court to vote for an en banc vote if he or she thinks it is of sufficient uh, importance. Beyond these procedures that the court has adopted, early on it adopted a relatively simple rule of stare decisis in the Newell case uh, that prior presidential decisions of the CCPA or of the Federal Circuit are binding until overturned by a subsequent decision on Bach. Um, the, I should have pointed out before when I started out, there, we, I wrote a paper with a committee for the Federal Circuit Bar Association that appears in the Federal Circuit Bar Association Law Journal in, 19, in 2001. Uh, it's a committee paper, so I couldn't bring it here and copy it because of copyright issues. Uh, but I believe it's online, and it uh, goes over many of the things I'm discussing tonight. But it also, uh, if you're interested, lists about 12 or 15 situations where there are intracircuit conflicts, uh, one of which was just recently decided in the Johnson & Johnston case, which involved um, the prior decisions in YBM and um, Maxo having to do with whether a, uh, an, a, an embodiment of an invention that's disclosed in a patent but not claimed is dedicated to the public. Um, I believe that the court uh, should deal with these cases, uh, with, as I said, without these sweeping decisions. Judge Cardoso uh, once said that uh, the law changes over time, inch by inch, with slow movement in one direction or another, and that results from a consent, and that results in a consensus from prior opinions, ra rather than didactic bright line tests. Um, I don't want to take up too much more time on this. Let me just say that it is very difficult to get en banc hearings at the court. Uh, about 200 petitions for rehearing are filed every year, and only a handful are granted. Um, and they were generally only granted where the parties can point out that there truly was a conflict in holdings, not in dicta. And a lot of lawyers despite what we learn in law school, always try to make dicta be a holding if it helps their case. And uh, it, some of the problems that arise in the court are because the lawyers try to over-lawyer their case or try to stretch their points. And so I think that's a good thing to bear in mind in your practice in general. Um, you should also bear in mind that it is not the purpose of the Supreme Court to um, decide intra-circuit conflicts. There's a Supreme Court case, Wisniewski versus the United States, where it said, where the court said, the primary task of the Court of Appeals is to reconcile its own internal difficulties. Um, so if you can't get it done at the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, the Supreme Court's not going to take it. So I think I've used that. You I'll pass the microphone. <coughs> uh, thanks, Pat. Uh, John Sweeney? Well, thanks for uh, inviting me, and uh, I'm privileged to be here uh, with this uh, great panel and uh, to see this beautiful room and uh, to have a chance to chat with you. Um, you know, prior to the uh, creation of the Federal Circuit, there was this concern about predictability and uniformity. There were problems there. But I think, as, as Steve mentioned in his opening remarks, there were even more serious problems. It was almost impossible to get a patent held valid. Uh, the Second Circuit right here was uh, very famous for never finding a patent uh, valid. They're, all the patents were uh, obvious or held invalid for obviousness. In fact, uh, uh, Thurgood Marshall, when he was being uh, uh, interviewed during his uh, confirmation hearings for uh, appointment to the Supreme Court, was asked what he thought about patents. And he said, well, you know, I'm from the Second Circuit. And we hold them invalid in the Second Circuit. So I think the patent practitioners and their clients felt that there really was a, a, a very serious problem. But there were some historical reasons for that. Uh, and the reasons were that in the early part of the 20th century, uh, there were large patent portfolios developed, uh, large cross-licensing uh, schemes developed, patent pools. Uh, price fixing was also often a part of uh, a cross-licensing. And uh, the antitrust uh, 
lawyers and the Supreme Court itself uh, was very leery about how patents were being used. So if you go back into the 60s, there's a famous case called Zenith versus Hazeltine, uh, in which uh, uh, Hazeltine uh, basically approached the licensee with hundreds of patents on the television and said, look, you have to license them all, and this is the price, and you can't just you know, litigate one and license the other. Uh, and the Supreme Court found that that was a, you know, a misuse of, uh, of the patent system. There was another famous case called Brulotti versus Thighs, in which uh, licensors demanded royalties uh, be paid, you know, even after the patents expired. So I think the judiciary in general, particularly the judiciary here in the Second Circuit, uh, was uh, skeptical about patents. And uh, one way around it was to look at a particular patent and say, well, that's uh, obvious. And they would use what we referred to as hindsight. There were some efforts, you know, way before the Federal Circuit to correct that. The patent statute was revised in 1952 to, with an objective standard. And there's the Graham versus John Deere case in the 60s that talked about an objective standard of obviousness. But nevertheless, uh, patents uh, were not being sustained. And that discouraged investment in technology and uh, discouraged companies from even considering bringing a patent suit. You could get a patent, but, you know, you really couldn't uh, do much uh, with it. So I think that was a strong, uh, you know, motivation uh, in the creation of the Federal Circuit as well. <clears throat> there is a, um, a law review article that summarizes some of this. You, it's uh, the Harvard Law Journal of Law and Technology, Volume 11. Uh, it's in the fall of 1997. And it, talked about, it talks about the Federal Circuit has brought a measure of predictability uh, to the U.S., uh, you know, patent system. Uh, and this predictability uh, had to some extent to do with uh, these objective tests of uh, obviousness. There was also, I think as Pat said, uh, you know, there, are different, there was actually different substantive patent law in the different districts. The on-sale bar uh, had one test here in the Second Circuit. I can't quite remember what it was. I know it was called the Timely Products Doctrine. I think there was this famous Second Circuit case. And there was a separate doctrine with separate criteria uh, in the Seventh Circuit and, and yet another in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, so there were those sorts of problems. And soon after the uh, uh, Federal Circuit was created, there were a number of cases where district court decisions of obviousness were, were pretty harshly uh, reversed. One is the uh, famous case called the Gore versus Garlock case that talks about using something called siren hindsight, sort of a flamboyant language to criticize this district judge from uh, 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 just instead of making an objective test of non-obviousness and looking at commercial success and long felt need of simply just saying, well, it seemed to be obvious to him, you know, at the time. So I think, uh, you know, in the 80s, the federal circuits certainly put patents uh, back on the map. Uh, companies began to uh, bring uh, uh, major patent cases where maybe they wouldn't have earlier. Uh, there were large damage awards, lost profits awards, as, as Steve said. And uh, patents litigation was no longer a backwater. It became very, very big business. Uh, and that has uh, led to the, you know, the growth of the patent system, the growth of the patent bar. Uh, when I got out of law school, almost nobody wanted to be a patent lawyer. And now, uh, you know, almost everyone uh, has to consider intellectual property because it's a very big part of our jurisprudence. Uh, so in, in some sense, the, the Federal Circuit has, I think, uh, you know, kept a lot of its promise. Uh, However, uh, another phenomenon, I think, uh, affected, has affected the Federal Circuit because our, there are still some predictability problems and there are still some conflicts. In fact, there are conflicts, uh, I think, right within the Federal Circuit itself so that you can get totally different results depending on which uh, judges you happen to draw. When you, when you argue an appeal, you're assigned the judges, uh, you just learn of the judges you have just a few minutes before you argue. I think they're assigned to the case uh, you know, maybe a couple of weeks before, but uh, you, you name the judges and uh, most uh, uh, practitioners can kind of pick the results, particularly on a claim construction issue or something of that sort. And this new phenomenon that has affected things is the, uh, 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 the prevalence of jury trials in, pat in the patent system. Uh, you know, of course, the, the, uh, you, know, you have a constitutional right to a jury trial in an action at law. So if you ask for damages, uh, you, you've always had that right. But that right wasn't exercised very often, uh, coincidentally, before the creation of the Federal Circuit. Uh, most of these cases were tried to judges. Uh, in fact, very few cases were tried at all. Uh, so there was a lot of form shopping. 
and a lot of motion practice, and, and usually the cases were settled. Uh, but uh, the, the I think uh, many lawyers decided to bring uh, to ask for a jury, uh, maybe because uh, they thought they had a little more advantage as the plaintiff patentee. Uh, the technology would not be uh, scrutinized and compared to the prior art as much, and the jury would assume that uh, after all, the patent office gave you the patent. The patent team should be right. And there were some big uh, jury awards. I think the Fed, some, some of the judges in the Federal Circuit uh, got pretty concerned about that because they thought maybe the patent wasn't really being uh, scrutinized enough. Uh, they were being persuaded by a, uh, an attractive uh, lawyer, advocate, or a great expert witness. Uh, and uh, so they've cut back on that quite a lot. Uh, they cut back on that in the Markman case, you're probably familiar with, you know, there's this claim construction issue. And they've cut back on it in the asbesto case before it went to the Supreme Court anyway, that uh, if there was an amendment made uh, during prosecution, that there was absolutely uh, no doctrine of equivalence. Well, you know, if claim construction is a legal issue, uh, that normally resolves the literal infringement issue because uh, there's usually no dispute about how a particular product works or, or its features. So you don't get a jury for literal infringement. And it also res resolves uh, oftentimes the anticipation issue, the novelty issue. Uh, the claim, it, once it's construed, it, it's either novel or not in view of uh, uh, the prior art. So the doctrine of equivalence was one of the ways that uh, plaintiffs would hang on to this uh, right to a jury to get their case uh, before a jury where they could, you know, uh, uh, make persuasive arguments, maybe a little extra legal in a sense. And uh, I think the Federal Circuit, some of the judges, uh, particularly Judge Clevenger, has, has always been very concerned about that. And uh, he would say that if you've made an amendment or you've made an argument at all, uh, there's no uh, doctrine of equivalence whatsoever. Uh, you don't get to a jury. Uh, Judge Plager didn't go through that analysis. He just didn't think you should have juries at all deciding, uh, you know, patent cases. And he said that, and I think it is an opinion in the, in the Markman case. Uh, so there... On the other hand, if we look at some of the opinions Judge Newman has written, I think she's uh, very in favor of the system where, you know, once the jury decides, you look at whether or not there was substantial evidence supporting uh, the verdict, and that's the scope of review. And if there's some substantial evidence, that uh, uh, that verdict gets affirmed. Uh, the uh, uh, There's a particularly good example of that recently. One of the, I don't mean to pick it sour grapes, but I did have a verdict overturned recently. Uh, uh, and in an opinion by Judge Clevenger saying that if an argument was made, if a legal argument was made, uh, there was an estoppel there, and therefore there was no, you know, application of the doctrine of equivalence whatsoever. So a jury verdict was taken away, essentially. And, uh, of course, the, uh, that same argument had been made in the N-Bank Festo case before the Supreme Court got involved. Uh, the Supreme Court did reverse the Federal Circuit, uh, on the prosecution estoppel uh, issue, saying that even if you've made an amendment, uh, you can still have a scope of equivalence if the amendment is, uh, if the equivalent wasn't foreseeable at the time, or if the uh, uh, the amendment was tangential to the equivalent. There's some limited scope of equivalence. Uh, yet, uh, 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 Judge Clevenger, in our case, it's called Accuscan versus Xerox, said, "Well, that that." that Festa Supreme Court doctrine has no applicability if you make a legal argument. If you have a legal argument, that's an absolute surrender and absolute estoppel. Yet in a very similar factual case, I think, uh, we have a case, it's, it's Molten Metal versus Metallics, uh, also this year, where Judge Newman is writing the opinion, and she's saying, look, if you have this argument, uh, that does not necessarily uh, eliminate the doctrine of equivalence. And incidentally, Judge Clevenger wrote a vigorous dissent in this Metallics case. Both of these cases were issued as or published as non-presidential cases. That means you can't cite them in a brief or argue them. So we, now we have a d dispute here within the federal circuit itself. And uh, these cases aren't even precedential. And I don't think we have uh, you know, the predictability uh, that's promised here. We have confusion. And our only real chance of resolving it is either to ask for a and in bank hearing and have the federal circuit resolve it or petition, uh, you know, to the Supreme Court, uh, which is, uh, you know, a long shot just to get your uh, case heard. And I think these cases are being issued as non-precedential 
it actually uh, uh, kind of perpetuates this uh, uh, this division or dichotomy in, in the court. So uh, I think I've probably run over my time. No, that, that's fine. Um, anybody, before we change, go to claim construction, anybody have any additional thoughts on uh, Federal Circuit in general? Uh, I, I think I do, since John <coughs> brought up prosecution estoppel. Uh, I, I was reading the very recent, last week, I guess, Festo <clears throat> Court of Appeals decision after Festo came down from the Supreme Court. And in a uh, concurrence, Judge Rader talked about predictability, and he talked about, uh, at least compared to common law standards, the lightning pace of change in the law at the federal circuit and commented that maybe that wasn't implying or stating that it wasn't such a great thing. And if you just think about prosecution estoppel, I'm not sure if I can get all the steps. We had a flexible rule, and then in Warner Jenkinson, uh, the court, the, the federal circuit uh, applied the flexible rule to determine whether there was a surrender or not of the claimed equivalent. And then the Supreme Court developed a new rule when that Warner Jenkinson went up, a, a rebuttable presumption that the reason for a change uh, for an amendment was uh, related to patentability and that there would be an estoppel as a result. We were left unclear whether the amendment had to only be to overcome prior art or not. There was an ambiguous statement in the Supreme Court decision. And then after that, the flexible rule was still being applied. Uh, if you look at the, the Lilly case, uh, the Litton case, uh, they were applying, the Federal Circuit applied a flexible rule. And then in Festo, as John said, all uh, the, the whole ground between a, uh, the amendment and the former claim, the ground, the difference in territory between the former claim and the, the new amended claim uh, was automatically surrendered if there had been any narrowing amendment. I mean, that, that was a rather dramatic ruling. Uh, and then it went up again. And uh, of course, the Supreme Court came out with a different rule, allowing for a flexible uh, rule, but yet with different, uh, yeah, a more narrow flexible rule than used to exist without going into the three criteria it left us with. And then it went back to the Federal Circuit, and the Federal Circuit was is saying, well, on one of those, whether, whether the uh, thing surrendered was foreseeable, one of the three issues. You could have a trial, and you could present evidence. So in the space of, uh, I don't know, 10 years, we've had a lot of different rules. And uh, that's a lot of activity. And it's, whereas before the Federal Circuit was created, as John said, the statistics were awful. Uh, the only one I could find was the Second Circuit saying in the 70s that 80% of patents were held invalid. Uh, but people thought two or three times before they'd assert a patent. So uh, uh, that's true. But now we have uh, a lot of change in the law and the predictability which the court is trying hard to, to achieve uh, is impaired simply because they are groping for the right rule, and it takes a long time uh, and the persuasion of a lot of different judges to get there. Thanks. It, it is said by some practitioners and some judges that with the Federal Circuit, we have achieved uniformity. There is one rule. The difficulty is that no one knows what that rule is. And um, th those who say that probably have a, uh, a point, but Let's move on to claim construction because this, again, is a creature um, probably unique to recent Federal Circuit jurisprudence, which now drives um, 
a whole lot about what we all collectively are involved with. And uh, let's have Herb, why don't you start us out on it? <coughs> yeah, why not? Well, again, I thank you for inviting me here. And uh, what I think li I'd like to say by way of preface is to me, if you ask the question about uniformity and stability in, or, or predictability in some way, I think it's the wrong question. I mean, the, the thing that the Federal Circuit did is created a sea change in the law. It certainly turned the patent law upside down from what it used to be before uh, we would, uh, uh, before it existed. However, in terms of predictability, I think it really has had a lot of problems. And uh, the, the statement made earlier that it's easier to advise clients, I guess I don't agree with that at all. I, to me, it was easy to advise clients before the Federal Circuit. You just were working in the universe where if you knew what court you were in, uh, you had some idea as to what might happen. Right now, uh, it's to me impossible to advise a client meaningfully even after a district court decision because an awful lot of times what happens in the Court of Appeals turns on the panel and you're not going to know the panel you get till five minutes before you get there. And the, the, the judges on the Federal Circuit are very sensitive about this topic and they have different views on it. Uh, it the, the published reversal rate in the Federal Circuit is 40 percent. And if any of you think about it, that's a staggering rate. And that, that suggests that basically uh, it's almost a toss of a coin as to whether you're going to win or lose on appeal. And uh, so I find that very troubling in terms of where the court is. But in terms of uh, is, is it more uniform? I don't really know. Is it a much stronger patent system? Unquestionably, yes. There's just no doubt about that. And what's happened with the Federal Circuit, which goes to claim construction, ultimately is uh, it, it used to be that the primary focus in patent cases was on validity and, and, and holding patents invalid for obviousness or other reasons. The Federal Circuit really shut the door on that. And what they decided to do was to convert an awful lot of issues into issues of law so they could be reviewed on appeal, which certainly is, is what en enhances the, the technical arguments that we talk about now. And uh, what happens if you convert a lot of arguments to issue, issues to issues of law Generally, in most patent cases, there's very little dispute as to the underlying facts. Most people believe, what most people can agree as to how the infringing devices work. The dispute is whether or not the words of the patent claim cover what that device does or what the process is, and that's what's what the fight is. And in getting a patent, uh, what happens is an applicant applies for a patent, writes up his or her best description of what the claim ought to be at the time, usually in light of what's actually shown in the patent, and then during the patent prosecution of that application, or sometimes what's called a continuing application years later, when they see what's on the market, they then change the words of the claim to try to make sure that they cover the new device or the new process. And then the question that you're ultimately litigating is, do the words of the claim, which were written to cover the device, really and fairly cover what the person invented at the time? And that's when you get into the issue of claim construction, and recently the Federal Circuit has been heading to a doctrine of what they call <clears throat> the plain meaning rule, which is that you look at, quote, the plain meaning of the claim, and, and there's a, quote, heavy presumption that, <clears throat> the, that a claim is to be interpreted according to its plain meaning as distinct from what's uh, actually descri uh, described and shown in the patent specification. <clears throat> and it seems to me what that rule does, it, it it, one, it, it puts the battlefield into the Court of Appeals, namely that the judges can decide what, what the plain meaning is, and they can decide uh, basically uh, more how, how the claim ought to be construed, and that usually ends the lawsuit. And I think John, John said that earlier. Usually once the claim is construed in 80% of the cases, that, means, that determines whether you win or lose on the construction of the claim. So... Uh, there's been a, a tendency towards what the Federal Circuit calls the plain meaning rule. However, it's not applied uniformly by all judges. And for instance, in the last six months, there's a bunch of cases which you can characterize as plain meaning cases. And then there's at least one and maybe some others, one of them, a case involving uh, someone called ALAC, uh, ALAC, I guess, in which the court sort of just abandoned the plain meaning rule because it decided it wanted to limit the patent. <laughs> And so it uh, basically took some limitations in the specification and read them into the claim. 
And so to me, what, what you have is, is two different doctrines. You have a doctrine where in the majority of cases, the court takes the plain meaning, but in some cases when a particular panel doesn't like that result, they then go look at the specification. And it seems to me a system like that, yes, it focuses on the patent being valid, and yes, that's much better than it used to be, but to me, uh, the result is very much panel dependent. I mean, this is a very specific example where the result is panel dependent. And that, that to me, is just one example of, uh, of what's happening in terms of one particular area of claim construction. Professor? All right. I will. This is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to present some slides of um, some work that I've been doing recently on claim construction. Um, wait a second until it comes up. Looks like it. Um, and so th what we've done, and this is this is a couple year project, is that up on the plasma screens out there? No? Yes? It is now? Okay, good. Because it looks fine from here. Except for that one, I don't know what's going on. Um, what, what this is, is a, is a couple year project looking at um, getting at kind of the issue that this uh, session is all about, which is, is the Federal Circuit succeeding in, in achieving uh, its stated mandate, um, uh, as has been talked about a little bit before. We look at this through the lens of claim construction in particular, and, and although, um, and this is somewhat a unique um, uh, study in the sense that we do this systematically. This is an empirical statistical study of uh, the claim construction jurisprudence at the Federal Circuit. We use every single case that the Federal Circuit's done since Markman uh, in 1996. Um, uh, we read them all. Um, what we basically do is, is collected all the cases and, we've, and read them, read a lot of the other academic literature, talked to a lot of practitioners, and it will come as certainly no surprise to anyone, um, certainly on the panel and probably a lot of you in the audience, that there is, in fact, uh, I think two broad ways the Federal Circuit um, uh, construes claims, uh, and and we name them, and, and these aren't the no one uses these names except for us. But you'll recognize. I mean, Herb was talking about the the kind of plain and ordinary meaning approach. That is that's kind of what we call a procedural approach. There's a real emphasis on process, a real emphasis on on having the plain meaning to begin with, a real presumption that that plain meaning is the right meaning of the term, um, and then you proceed from there. You may change that plain meaning, but as a general matter, the presumption is that the plain meaning is going to control. The other end of the spectrum is what we call holistic, which is a much more open-ended, um, uh, broad-based, the, the real question for the holistic procedure is what's the right result, right? What did, what did the, the patentee mean? What's the best meaning that we can find using the, the entire um, uh, set of information we've got at our disposal? And, and we're not going to be too concerned about, about presumptions or weightings or things like that. We're just going to look and find the best uh, meaning we can given the set of information we have out there. And so those are the, the two kind of, and, and, and between those and well within those groups, there's, there's different kind of forms of that. We designate them strong forms, intermediate form, and a weak form. So there are some opinions that you read where they're, they just say, you know, it's the ordinary meaning and we don't want to hear anything else, right? There's a presumption, that's it, we're done, right? Um, there are others where they hedge. They say, oh, maybe, and we're going to look a little bit at, at other information. We're not going to have a real heavy presumption. Same thing with holistic. They're strong, intermediate, and weak. And so we classify, uh, ended up being, the, the first cut was about 700 cases, and then ended up with about 415 cases, um, uh, classified all of those. And here's what you get as your basic results. Um, you get about 63% um, uh, since Markman. This is all since 1996. Uh, procedural and and 37 percent holistic, right? But of course that doesn't tell the whole story. And the most kind of interesting stuff is all of the trends. And if you just look at procedural versus holistic, uh, the y-axis there on the left is is the number of opinions um, that are classified as holistic during the time periods. Along the bottom uh, is time periods uh, basically measured in quarters. So uh, as you go to the right, you're going further along in time, and you can see that's that and in fact that is a statistically significant trend line that shows the court has gone from you know say the mid 40 percentile uh, percent of finding a holistic of using a holistic approach to now more like the mid 30s 
um, over time. You can see it, it jumps around, but that's, that's a, a clear trend that we found. The other interesting trend that we found is if you look at the judges in particular and, and who's authoring these cases, there's been a real, real sea change in the federal circuit since um, uh, on our axis about the year 2000. Um, and what's happened is judges that we classify, and I'll talk about this in a minute, as, as the extremely procedural judges have suddenly, for a variety of reasons, and we can talk about why, become much, much more active. Uh, they're authoring many more opinions. Their opinions are, are much more easily classifiable as procedural opinions. They seem to be backing each other up. There's kind of a critical mass uh, of them now. There are a few key cases in the year 2000 that seem to have um, spurred this on. Um, and this is, of course, 2000 is when Judges Dyke and Lynn came on the court. Um, and I think that change has really made um, a tremendous difference in the, the way that claim construction is going. The other thing that we see is increasing polarization. And by this we mean increasing amounts of people writing strong forms of the opinions on one end of the spectrum or the other. So what you're seeing is on the one hand you're getting a real trend towards proceduralism. People are getting more and more procedural all the time. Uh, you're seeing more of those strong procedural cases. But there also appears as a backlash effect going on. There's also a lot of fairly strong um, uh, holistic opinions being written as well, almost as a, as, as a kind of attempted counterweight. And this graph shows you the, the blue line, the top line there, shows you the, the, the percentage of strong, strong opinions and then the percentage of weak opinions. So there are fewer and fewer and fewer weak opinions. In one sense, that's good, right, because it's the weak opinions that are really confusing and really difficult to figure out. On the other hand, you're getting more and more kind of polar opposite opinions being issued, which leads to kind of its own sense of confusion, um, which panel are you going to get, right? And so speaking of panels, we can actually now that we have all this data, we can grind it out for each judge. And this, this puts the judges along the, the bottom axis and tells you each judge on the federal circuit since 1996, what's their propensity for writing a, a holistic opinion. That means the people who are most holistic are to the right. You can see our three people on the right are, are Lurie, Newman, and Judge Bryson. The three people who are least holistic, most procedural, are on the left. This is Judge Dyke, Judge Clevenger, and Judge Lynn. The range here is pretty Im impressive. You get a range as an author of, of Judge Dyke, who only authors um, uh, holistic opinions in the 7% range, versus Judge Bryson, who authors uh, holistic opinions 70% of the time. So it's a huge range in terms of the judges. The other interesting thing you can see about this graph is that you've got kind of this cluster at one end, um, Dyke, um, Clevenger, Lynn, and a, a cluster on the other end, Lurie, Newman, Bryson. And in the middle, there's a lot of judges that seem to float. Right? They seem to kind of go with the panel, whatever's kind of going on. Maybe they're getting the right result. Maybe they, they kind of flow either way. It's hard to tell what they're doing, but there's a fair amount of judges, um, about half of them, that don't seem to have any real clear um, uh, methodological approach that we can discern. So if you start looking at the factions, you can e easily divide these, these folks up into three factions. And we name them the proceduralists, Dyke, Clevenger, and Lynn, the swing judges, which are the ones in our data set who, who don't seem to have a, sig a significant effect on claim construction, and the most holistic judges who, again, do seem to have a significant effect when they're on the panel, and it seems to go towards a holistic direction. Right? Um, we also uh, test how inconsistent they are and, and can rank them that way, too. And this, what we mean by inconsistency is how often do they flip between different methodological approaches. Um, you can see Judges Dyke, Clevenger, and Lynn are extremely consistent. I think that's consistent with that earlier graph I showed that showed uh, you know, a, a marked increase in, in the, their authorship activity. Um, and and um, the most interesting thing here is the mean of all the judges, um, only Dyke, Clevenger, and Lynn are more consistent than the mean. They are so much more consistent than anyone else on the court at their methodological approach. It's really quite striking. Um, and, and it really comes through. And the big thing that we get out of this is the federal circuit is changing quite a bit. If you look at kind of a list of uh, people in terms of who's most procedural, who's most holistic, you can start to see a pattern here, and that is the younger, newer judges seem to be much more procedural in approach than the older judges um, uh, do. There's some, some variability there, but you definitely see that. Um, and and uh, so that suggests that this trend is going to continue and even accelerate. Um, so you can also do, we ran some regressions to figure out uh, judges that have a statistically significant impact on methodological approach.
about half the judges do. What you can do is then use that to predict. Um, given a panel, uh, we can kick back essentially a number, a percentage number to you of, of uh, procedural versus holistic. I'm sure to the practitioners in the room, none of these results would come as much as surprise as a surprise. It's probably exactly the kind of instinct you would get when you think about a panel. Um, and in fact, if you set up kind of uh, the panels, and this graph shows you um, uh, kind of hypothetical panels. If you the top bar on the right side there is is two proceduralists and a and a holistic judge, you're going to get a hundred percent of those cases is go, are going to be uh, procedural. If you get two proceduralists and a, and a swing judge, another 100%. A procedural and two holistics, you get about 85% or so. Um, and on down the list, and you see if you get three holistics, you get 100% the other way. It really makes a huge difference. There is clear, and we can prove it statistically to 95% certainty, that there is, in fact, panel dependency at the federal circuit. Um, and so, I mean, one of the motivations, of course, for this was it, that the, the judges, although everyone up here seems to agree that there's panel dependency on the federal circuit, um, the judges just refuse to kind of deal with this in any meaningful way. Um, and in fact, uh, several of them, Judge Michelle in particular, has written several articles where he says there is none. I estimate that, that there's no, you know, I, I've tested it uh, and with my internal data and I don't find any. Um, Judge Markey once wrote uh, something that he published, and he said, you know, no one's ever going to prove panel dependency because no one's going to do that much work. Um, and, and so we just went out and did it. Um, and, and so there are a variety of very interesting um, aspects of this. You can look at more of this stuff at, at our website. And in particular, we do have a little uh, web form that you can pull down the names of each judges, and it'll kick back a number to you of, of how they're going to decide the case. And that actually makes judges really mad, which is actually the point of uh, the project. So. Thanks. OK. <laughs> Claim construction. Um, Her Herb and I were at a, a panel a couple years ago that Judge Plager was on, and uh, I think it probably fairly um, expresses the view of a lot of district court judges. Um, and the story goes back to some other people who got some gray hair. There was a famous Major League Baseball umpire, Bill Clem, and he was in the presence of um, some of the Yankee big mouth pitchers who were talking about how great their fastball was or their spitball or, or whatever. And then he made a, an observation that basically says, you guys aren't anything. It's nothing until I call it. And that's, in essence, what's happened in the federal circuit with a 42% reversal rate. Uh, you can imagine the frustration on the part of the district judges who are kind of in a why should I bother if this baby's got 42% shot of coming back to me, um, and there's really nothing I can do about it. Why should I go through the rigors of paying that much attention to trial? And sometimes it's hard to get a patent trial uh, because of that bias. Um, it's a new initiative. What we used to do is simply take uh, <coughs> every, each side had its view of what the claim meant. Witnesses would testify about it on their own view of what it means and try to trash the opposing view to the extent that it mattered, and the, the judge or jury would come to a conclusion, and that would end it. Uh, that is a thing of the past, and um, as far as the outcome predictability, there is nothing more destructive of predictability than, than claim construction. It's caused Judge Young and a, 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 a chief, chief judge in Massachusetts, who people have some regard for, to call the federal circuit quote, a most peculiar court, end quote. And so that goes in the rank of, of uncertainty, and um, uh, it's a serious problem procedurally for people who want to get to trial and um, procedurally for uh, those who want to know what the outcome of that trial is, although I will say this, that we were on the right end of a decision reversal on claim construction last Monday in a major pharmaceutical case. And uh, uh, you, you play them like they lie, but they lie in crooked ways sometimes these days. Okay. Um, are, are anybody else on 
claim construction. The final topic is uh, notions of equivalency, uh, claim scope, and whatever. And um, um, Terry Sobel will tell us something about that. Just a word on the statistics before I touch my topic. As I was leaving my office, I, uh, my colleague Steve Elliott pulled off the uh, Federal Circuit's administrative office's uh, statistics, and there's a percent reversal by subject, the subject matter of the uh, cases. And there's a patent and trademark office topic. And for the year ending September 30, 02, it says 20% reversal rate. Now, of course, I don't know how one computes that 20%, but uh, there's also, of course, published stuff indicating that the reversal rate is closer to 40. So, uh, the by the way, the the administrative office of the other 11 circuits uh, for a different time period, so they're not comparable. There's a slight discontinuity in the two time periods. Is under 10% for civil matters. So that's what the official statistics say. Uh, in thinking uh, about my topic, I try to consider where the Federal Circuit was headed. I, I tried to look at the trajectory of uh, one class of case, uh, and I, I tried to look at it from the perspective of whose ox was being gored. So if you think about patent situations, you have a patent owner and you have an infringer. I mean, that's what happens in litigation. So you can favor one or the other. You can favor innovation if you want to read that as a proxy for patent owner. If you want to stimulate innovation, you want to favor the patent owner. And uh, if you want to favor infringers, you might say that you want to give them uh, notice of what the patent covers uh, so they can design around what the patent uh, uh, covers. Uh, so I looked at it from that perspective, and it, it was really quite interesting because there aren't that many en banc cases, but two in recent years, uh, Warner Jenkinson and Festo, have dealt with this subject. They've dealt with equivalency and prosecution estoppel. Equivalency draws a lot of attention uh, because it goes beyond the literal scope of the patent. And, and there have been debates in the past over what justifies that. Uh, there's no, to take a, a step back, there's no question that patentees are better off now, as, as Herb Schwartz said very emphatically, than they used to be before the Federal Circuit. And, and that 80% reversal rate that the Second Circuit talked about is, is a thing of history. But after 1982, when the Federal Circuit got going, the first few years, it seemed to me, were very, very favorable to patentees. The Federal Circuit was kind of straightening out uh, some of the damage that the uh, very critical circuits, critical of patents, that is, circuits had endorsed. So I just picked out one. The presumption of validity in some circuits used to have virtually no effect. And the Federal Circuit uh, said, oh, no, it's important. And in fact, to overcome it, you have to prove your case to show invalidity by clear and convincing evidence. The uh, many, many circuits said it was preponderance or some obscure term that meant something like that. So the Federal Circuit in those earlier years uh, really uh, beefed up uh, the patentee's position. Uh, but as they got going, uh, things uh, changed. And Markman is one significant event, very significant event. You've heard a lot about it. Uh, without repeating what's been said, uh, what, what did the court do uh, very briefly? It converted what Steve just explained had been a fact issue uh, that you would present to the jury 
as usually as part of something else who wins or is the patent obvious or not valid or not uh, to a legal question that the Court of Appeals decided and that the Court of Appeals would review de novo when these decisions came up from the district courts instead of with deference. So they, they put themselves in the position to control outcomes more perhaps than before. Uh, and uh, this was explained as, you know, with some at least theoretical justification, I think, promoting predictability because we'd have, and the, and the Supreme Court endorsed this, we'd have judges doing that job instead of uh, the juries that the federal circuit seems, or many judges in the court, seem to distrust. Uh, you know, they have, who knows what juries will do. The court didn't say that, but that's the impression I get. And if we want predictability, we want someone to be able to pick up the patent and know what the claim covers. And, and that's where this idea that you, that has been perhaps a little bit abandoned lately, but this idea that you look only at the prosecution record. Everybody can read that, pick it up, and the idea is figure out what the patent means. So that would give you predictability. It hasn't quite worked out that way because district judges, many of whom are reasonable people, sometimes uh, frequently can disagree with the reasonable people on the Court of Appeals. Uh, but the bias in the Markman and claim construction area, the reason for Markman was to favor patentees, I submit. The same notion, I suggest, applied on the doctrine of equivalence. Uh, the Warner Jenkinson case, uh, well, perhaps I ought to start further back. If you go back to the early years on the doctrine of equivalence, the Federal Circuit actually said, uh, held, that you look at the patent as a whole and then you decide whether there's a similar function way and result for the accused thing the federal circuit got away from that in the late 80s when they said you have to have an equivalent for each element of the claim the so-called all limitations or all elements rule so again they're moving towards precision predictability and making it harder for the patentee to prevail on equivalence. Maybe by imposing this, which you might call discipline, uh, narrowing the patent. Uh, uh, then in Warner Jenkinson, the court invited, uh, took, took the case en banc and invited answers to questions. The questions indicate that there were a lot of judges on that court who would like to limit equivalence further, to give the trial judge discretion over whether, even if there is infringement by equivalence, whether to uh, allow the patentee to prevail in the case. Uh, the same notion was implicit in a question which uh, uh, asked about whether to give it to the jury or you know, whether it was an equitable issue for the court. Getting it away from the jury trial judges are more predictable, uh, that idea. That didn't succeed because the Federal Circuit couldn't uh, muster a majority for those views and the, the same rule continued to apply. It went to the jury. Uh, substantially the same function way result was the rule. But on, a, <clears throat> on appeal to the Supreme Court, the uh, criticism of the doctrine of equivalence seemed to reach the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court uh, applied this new, or adopted this new presumption on prosecution estoppel. After all, what's prosecution estoppel? It's a, a way of defeating a claim of, equi of equivalence. If you surrendered the ground uh, in amending your claims, you can't assert that that ground is equivalent to what you literally claimed. Uh, so the Supreme Court took a, a shot. It said, we're not, you know, we're not going to sound the death knell. That's a, a rough approximation of doctrine of equivalence. But they did impose this new uh, anti-patentee presumption. And then when we get to Festo, the Federal Circuit 
not having succeeded in Warner Jenkinson in doing major damage to the doctrine of equivalence, came at it from prosecution estoppel and said, we have a complete bar. If you narrowed your claim, no equivalence, you're finished, at least as to that element of the claim. And uh, that went up and the Supreme Court wouldn't go that far. It said, we, we want to give more credit as this uh, as we have been doing for a hundred years to a doctrine of equivalence but still they narrowed uh what had been the flexible rule on estoppel uh and in conclusion the trajectory is for the uh, uh accused infringer it's for at least theoretical notions of predictability uh, for making it easy to des easier to design around because of those notions and not in favor of the breadth of the patent or the patentee. Thanks. Anyway. <laughs> As uh, requested, we now have somewhere, <coughs> something like 15 or 20 minutes for questions. Uh, surely all of this must have stimulated somebody to have something on his mind. Um, you can ask a question and address it to one of the panelists if, um, uh, if that became the source of the inquiry, or I'll ask for volunteers among the panelists if um, uh, the question isn't specifically directed. Anybody? Yes, sir. mean beyond claim construction because we didn't test beyond claim construction I mean what the real I mean and this kind of raises some other issues that have, that have come up a couple of times um, on the on the panel and that is I think the real kind of debate you've got you've got a real kind of struggle going on at the federal circuit right now and it's really between people who believe strongly in rules and people who believe strongly in standards and that is it plays out I mean you can just you know, change procedural to rules and change holistics to standards, and that it works out. And those are the judges. And the interesting thing is that you see the judges that everybody's been talking about a little bit tonight on the other ends of the spectrum. Judge Clevenger is very rule oriented, very procedural. Um, Judge Dykes the same way. Judge Newman is at the other end of the spectrum. Every time there's something, you know, a an opinion that comes out that's very standards oriented, very flexible, very um, kind of non rule based. It's, it's almost always a, a Judge Newman one. And the thing that we see that's, I think, interesting in doing this kind of big empirical studies, you can see trends. And, and I think it's pretty clear at this point that the court is moving away from the, the standards-based approach towards a rule-based approach, I think, in large measure because they're trying to get at this predictability issue. And their, their view is that these uh, rules are much more likely to be predictable and useful for people at uh, district court level and, and, and parties involved in possible disputes than the standards are going to be. I think is uh, to repeat a theme that several people have, sp <clears throat> have spoken about before. The way this process really works is uh, you have no idea who's going to be on the panel when you write the brief. You have no idea who's going to be on the panel when you pick the issues uh, which are going to be um, raised on appeal. You have no idea who's going to be on the panel when you decide how to uh, skew the claim construction, although that's usually necessary by some of the merits of the case. Um, on the morning of the appeal, I forgot whether it's 8.30 or quarter of 9, they post um, in the federal circuit who the panel is going to be. Uh, before you go, <clears throat> before you go down and argue the appeal, most people will have a chart of um, the judges and which judges were on the panels of which cases seem to be important for the issues in that uh, in that appeal. And um, uh, so a lot of this uh, 
I think John was commenting as we're sitting here, we're going to get your chart the next time we go down to appeal, and I'm going to use my very best holistic words, whatever they are, <laughs> turn out to be. But there's a little, relatively little flexibility. I'm not sure um, this is insightful, but um, uh, you, the die is cast uh, when the uh, brief goes in. They could, they could, of course, announce, like almost all other circuits do, announce uh, a month or so before, even two months. So even, you could get a sign, a panel, when you, before you write the brief. The court, the judges have been very against that, but other circuits do um, have, a, have a system where you get a sign, you know the panel before you write the brief. Well, <laughs> I love the notion of I'll take one Clevenger and one Newman. <laughs> uh, any, anybody? Yes, sir. Are you... Uh, I'm just standing here for my health. Now, I, I have a question for Professor Wagner. There's follow. a question in the gallery. Yes, sir. Uh, I was wondering if you, in your research, reading the full opinions, have determined whether the methodology used by the panel actually affects the outcome of the case. Um, well, yes, it absolutely does. In fact, we, we tested that because we get that question a lot. And, and we find that 95% of the time that there's a dissent or a concurrence disputing the claim construction at the Federal Circuit, it's because they're flipping methodological approach. Um, over 85% of the time when they reverse district court opinions, it's because the district court and the Federal Circuit are using different methodological approaches. So it does, but you can't all, it doesn't, doesn't translate directly to saying, you know, patentee wins or, or, or whatever, right? Because sometimes you want to broad claim construction, sometimes you don't. So it doesn't translate real well to that, but it definitely it unquestionably affects the results, plus it's what everybody argues about. So. Have you found that within the Federal Circuit decisions themselves, meaning like two cases, given similar facts, have had different outcomes based on the methodology used or the people who are... Yeah, I mean, it depends what you mean by different facts. I mean, you know, we're all lawyers. We can all come up with ways to make cases look really alike, right. and we can all come up with ways to make distinguish the cases. So what we do know is that when on the very same case, there is an alternative opinion, either a dissent or a concurrence, on the same set of facts saying this is the wrong claim construction, here's the right one, 95% of the time that happens, it's a different methodological approach than the majorities. Yeah, I mean, there's one well-known case where, there, and I guess I was in a piece of it, where three different panels looked at it and had three different claim constructions. Uh, we There was a case in the district court. We took the case over after it had been lost in the district court. We persuaded it. Uh, a second panel to stay an injunction based on a construction. Then there was a full hearing. A different panel looked at it, came up with a different claim construction. Then it went back. Another case on the same patent came up, and they had a third claim construction. So we really had three different constructions on the exact same <coughs> patent and essentially the same <coughs> infringement. And uh, there are some of the judges who lament how that could happen, and other judges sort of put their head in the sand and don't believe it happened. But it did happen. So I think there was another question over here. Yes, sir. Um, a couple of the panelists uh, mentioned the federal circuit's uh, non-presidential opinion. I wonder if we're getting thoughts on um, how exactly they're choosing what opinion to make non-presidential and uh, whether that's being used in any way to uh, resolve or avoid some of these opinions. Well, uh, I, I, you know, I don't care for the practice. Uh, you could probably tell that by the way I presented it. And there are certain circuits, and maybe the Ninth Circuit, I think, is considering, you know, uh, a rule against having that. Uh, it, it's a uh, my, my, my sense is that uh, uh, if a particular panel, uh, uh, let's say they're holistic, maybe, and do, uh, the others are rule-based, uh, and they, they know there's a dispute with another group on the court, uh, they make that a non-presidential opinion, and uh, I think once you have a non-presidential opinion, it's much less likely it's going to be reviewed and banked by the whole court. And uh, there's much less chance, I think, also of getting your case uh, up for certiorari. So it kind of sweeps things under the rug here. Just one little case, uh, one one litigant doesn't get what he wants, and... Uh, you know, and somewhere else, a litigant has that same position in a similar case, happens to get another panel, and he wins, you know, because he's got a different panel. But it, it, I think it is a little a little bit of a way of avoiding uh, confrontation all the time. Uh, I agree with what John said. I think it's a way of sort of burying the debt 
uh, by the court or hiding their mistakes. Um, and if you look at the presidential opinions, it, it, enough of them, it comes right out at you. Um, my comment is there was, there was a decision in 2001 in the Eighth Circuit. I can't remember the name of the case, but it's mentioned in our paper at the Federal Circuit on the intra-circuit conflicts in which the court, Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals held that it was unconstitutional for courts to issue non-presidential decisions. Um, the case, the case um, was settled and the opinion was withdrawn. But it raised an interesting question. I mean, as I said before, the, I quoted Judge Cardoso, the common law is built on case decisions. And why shouldn't they all be presidential? Yeah. They always used to be. I think it's just a dodge by the court. Yeah, it's very disturbing. Sometimes you will have an issue. I remember we had a case where a part, we had won a case and the other side took an appeal prematurely before the damages were computed. Uh, but they brought in a new law firm and they took an appeal. And we wanted to that appeal to be dismissed. We made a motion to the federal circuit. And there was a non-presidential case exactly right on point, you know, supporting us. But you couldn't cite it. It was very awkward, you know. The and, official line, of course, is is that it's workload based, right? I mean, <clears throat> having been a clerk there just a couple of years ago, they definitely at least think that this is this is why they choose presidential versus non presidential. And I think that's that's not inconsistent with your with with you know reading these opinions. I mean, the the thing is, you spend. A, a lot less time, uh, I mean, not even a tenth the amount of time you spend um, dealing with a, a presidential opinion than you do on a non-presidential. So it could be, it's maybe it's not so much that the non-presidential opinions are having some other different type of analysis, but just that they're, you know, frankly, kind of crap, right? I mean, they're just really poor quality compared to the to the presidential opinions because they get very little attention around the court. You, you, don't, you don't get a different, you don't get those at half price or third price or something like that. It seems to me everybody. <laughs> Right. I'm not, I'm not supporting the, the procedure, but it, it, that's, that's certainly what the judges think they're doing. They think they're doing it for workload reasons. Well, I, I think from a client's point of view, and I agree with my two colleagues, it's, it's just a terrible thing. The tremendous amount of time, effort, and money and go into these cases, and people have very strong feelings, and you really think you're entitled to a full and fair shake and entitled to get a, a decision that, that you can go to the bank on. And uh, I have great trouble. Uh, fathoming any of the real any of the justifications for it. I'd like to ask a question. Uh, considering the divergence of all the possibilities for different views about what claim terms mean, do we all feel that it would be better to go back to the pre-82 or the pre-Markman system where you would treat the claim construction as a fact issue give it to the jury, have it submerged so you don't know what the claim means or you don't know what the jury thought the claims meant. It's submerged in some other uh, general verdict or special interrogatory answer or special verdict. Uh, and then have them, ha have the decisions reviewed with deference so that frequently the claim term is never scrutinized because you give deference to what the jury did and the, it's all uh, unclear what the claim was decided to mean. I mean, would, would we prefer that as distinct from this uh, uh, divergence of opinion situation, which may be uh, unavoidable given the ambiguities in language? I mean, that's why we have poetry in I, I think it's going to, of course, for a bunch of trial lawyers, it depends on what side of the case you have. Right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, the Mark, I know this existed even with the Federal Circuit before the Markman it. case. And, uh, you know, the Markman facts, I, I think that term was uh, inventory, the contentious term in the claim. And uh, it, it, the patent explained that it had to do with, I think, clothing, dry cleaning inventory. Yes. And um, the... Uh, you know, the plaintiff pr presented an expert and he said, well, look, uh, you know, accounts receivable, financial, you know, things can be, that can satisfy the definition. And the jury agreed with him. And it kind of flew in the face of uh, the definition in the patent. And of course, if you're on the losing side of that case, 
where this expert, you know, makes up this thing out of thin air and you lose and you nobody even reads the patent, I think you you feel like you don't want to go back all the way to those days, right? You want to So maybe you say that well there wasn't a scintilla of evidence or whatever the deference rule means. In other words, you have to right. overcome that threshold. I think they I think basically and when jury trials got very popular, uh, you know, there were some very skillful advocates and who basically, uh, you know, pushed the envelope and uh, you know, got away with some things and the the federal circuit said look we're going to put a stop to that and i had a markman hearing just shortly after uh, the markman case came down for the federal circuit and the i tried to explain to the judge you know that she had to construe each of these terms and she said well you know that's going to the supreme court let's not bother and uh you know they just didn't feel it was necessary and the district judges of course makes a lot more work for them you know, and, and at the beginning, after Markman, most of the district judges criticized the Markman approach. But now I think everybody's kind of gotten used to it. Yeah. So now that we settled on the rules, maybe we should just leave them alone for five or six years, you know, and until I retire. I, I was going to say in answer to what Jerry said, that I think an awful lot of it depends whether you have a pro plaintiff or a pro, pro defendant point of view or who you represent the most. Uh, but one thing I think is clear that, that the patent system has been so strengthened by the federal circuit that to me the pushback is still relatively minor compared to what the patent system in the U.S. was 30 years ago. And I also think that if you compare our patent system <clears throat> to anywhere else in the world right now, we have, we have a much stronger patent system than almost any country I can think of. And, and therefore, in, in that sense of the word, I'm not, I think, prepared to go back to a Wild West free-for-all system. I think it would push it even further in, in the direction of maybe two pro patent that you'd probably see some legislative pushback. I think that, that that's probably a reasonable place to end. Our, our time is uh, is up. Uh, the reality is, whatever one thinks about going back, um, as Herb would suggest, and I think as everyone would suggest, we are in, in a uh, an era where patents are much more important uh, assets than they were before that. There is always some danger of hearing people with this much experience speak because. Uh, uh, they can afford to do what's right as opposed to what's do what, what's good for the business. And the reality is, in 1982, before the federal circuit, the M&A guys had the houses in the Hamptons, and we had the houses on the Jersey Shore. At this point, the situation is reversed. And so, <laughs> why don't we end there? Thank you. Thank you. Both.